My out studio partner for today's program is Greg Durrell. Greg, thanks for coming back. Tom, always a pleasure to do anything with you. Okay. Well, for our listeners' information, we're going through Paul's epistle to the Romans. We're in chapter 1, and last week we left off with, well, we finished verse 17, chapter 1, verse 17, so we'll pick up with 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, that's kind of a tough verse to start with, but give us a little background for that, Greg. Well, it's a great verse because he starts off by saying, for the wrath of God. Now, obviously, wrath is the the opposite. It's the antithesis of righteousness, and it's an expression of God's person. And God has wrath and has promised that he will extend his wrath to this world. Now, he says, so the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all, firstly, ungodliness, and ungodliness is, is sort of a state of being. You can be ungodly and perhaps not demonstrate that overtly. All sorts of people that are ungodly, when, when they're caught finally, their neighbors didn't know that they were as ungodly, didn't know they were the serial killer or whatever they may have been, the drug dealer or whatever. And then he says unrighteousness. And unrighteousness is more a reference to our conduct. So he says not only is it going to be revealed from heaven against our state of being, but also against our conduct. And he says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now that's, that's sort of a, an interesting thing, because uh, how could someone who, who really understands and really reads and knows the truth of God's Word hold that in unrighteousness? But when we understand the fall of man, we understand that man in and of himself has nothing redeemable in him, then it starts, I think, to make a little sense. Mm-hmm. And I think Paul begins here showing us the basis for the condemnation of mankind, that all are subject to it, and it's going to come upon all those who do not come to the righteousness of God. Right. And this is set up really by verse 17, which we went over last week. But just just to remind us, oh, well, I'll read it. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So we have the just living by faith. They're made just because of their belief in Christ. But what about the other side? The other side is the wrath of God being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Without faith, we fall into that category. We are before God, not only ungodly, but unrighteous, and our penalty is the eternal separation from him. Well, you know, and and if ever in probably the history of man, if there was ever a time when we could say that the world is just permeated with ungodliness, which would be perhaps another way to put it would be a lack of proper reverence for the Lord, and then unrighteousness, literally, which would be wickedness toward God and man. I think we could surely say we're at a time when there is an immense lack of reverence for the Lord, and certainly there's an overwhelming abundance of wickedness towards God and man. Mm -hmm. But there's a solution to that, and Paul is going to give us that solution after he makes sure he makes the case that no one can claim that they can skirt by this, or they didn't know, or it doesn't apply to me. He makes it so plain that even a child could understand it. Well, let's pick up with that. Again, we have God referring to his wrath being poured out against all ungodliness and unrighteousness. And Greg, you mentioned people like you know, you know, we all know obvious evil from serial killers on down. Sure. Uh, just check the newspapers, see what's going on. And it's the time of the Iraqi war. And, you know, I just read today some articles about the, the Saddam Hussein regime and they're torturing people. It's just, just almost so difficult to read and understand that man could be that evil. However, there's the little old lady from Pasadena. There are those who never really hurt anybody, never really did anything overtly wrong that we could see, never got a parking ticket or you name it. But they would still come under these categories of ungodliness and unrighteousness, right, Greg? 
Absolutely. And, and again, he says, who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So we're not talking necessarily to the extreme where someone has to be an Osama bin Laden in this category, but again, lack of proper reverence towards the Lord. If you reject the truth, and obviously John seventeen seventeen, his word is truth, mm-hmm. if you're turning to your own means, whether it's through your own religion, through some religious effort, to try and establish your own righteousness, then in essence you're, you're holding the truth in unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And Paul is he's just going to nail it down for us. Well, here we go. Verse 19, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Profound. Absolutely. Verse 19 is, is an interesting thing because he says, because that which may be known of God is manifest. And where does he say it's manifest? He says it's manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. You know, they've never discovered a tribe of atheists anywhere. In the most remote part of, of any continent, the most primitive culture or society, They've never discovered a group of people who did not recognize that there was a supreme being. They've right. never discovered a group of atheists like that. Why is that? Because God places it in man that he exists. He shows it unto them. And he says in verse 20, For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Well, someone says, well, how could that be clearly seen? He says, being understood by the things that are made. Even these primitive cultures recognized that. They had no Bibles. They had no theology books. They had no radio program to listen to. They had no church to, to attend. But how did they know these things? Because God revealed it to them. And that's the answer when someone says, well, what about the person on the desert island that's never heard the gospel? And my response to, to, to that is, what island? What person? God reveals it in everyone, Mm -hmm. everyone, and he says so that they are without excuse. Otherwise, then God wouldn't be just, and someone might die without the righteousness of Christ, and he could say, well, gee, I didn't have a chance. Mm -hmm. I didn't know. I didn't hear. And God would say, I clearly manifested myself in you. I demonstrated to you, you knew that I existed, but you rejected me. And Paul goes on, we'll see, where we just corrupt the being of, of the Creator so much where the creature begins literally to worship the creature more than the Creator. Mm-hmm. Greg, we, on the one hand, as you said, we have the primitive people, and that's where <laughs> many people like to point and say, well, what about that group, and, and so on. And as you said, they all have some ritual, some religious system, and so on. There is a, a seeking after God. But let's, let's go to the other end of the spectrum. Let's go into a laboratory where we have scientists, biologists, chemists, and so on and so forth. There's a group who would probably call themselves atheists. Many would be evolutionists and so on. What's been demonstrated for them? Those who have the ability to look into a cell— I call it a simple cell, but there's no such thing. It's so com- it's more complex than New York City, according to Linus Pauling, Nobel Prize winner. But the issue is, as you look into the cell, into the nucleus of a cell, you find DNA. You find information. One cell, as it develops, uh, replicates. It goes from one cell. It develops into a body by the reproduction of 75 trillion cells. That's, that's the number for the cells within the human body. 
How does it do that? It does it on the basis of the of information within the DNA, within the nucleus of a cell. All the information is there. Where did that information come from? It's intelligent. It's digital inf- coded information that instructs the body how to develop. Where did that come from, Greg? Random chance. Oh, know. right. Isn't that what they say? Isn't I, I think. Amazing? Yeah, I think they're found in verse 22, those folks, professing themselves to be wise, they become fools, because a person with a third grade education doesn't believe in evolution. You have to be, I've said for years, you have to be educated to be that stupid. No person would pull up in the front of an automobile dealership and say, gee, look at the coincidence of a bunch of parts coming together by themselves and forming that, that car. I mean, you can see design. There has to be a master designer. Plus, Greg, I have to throw this in. If you took the nucleus of a cell and you tried to put as many as you could on the head of a pin, you'd be able to put a thousand of these things. So, in other words, all this information that we've been talking about that God has laid out for the development of of the human body is done in such a microscopic format that we couldn't even come close to producing anything like this, so let alone superior, the complexity. to any computer or oh. any technological system we have. We can't even touch it, and we'll never be able to touch it. And this is not according to you know, my uh, sort of unscientific mind, but according to the experts. It's just beyond our capacity. Absolutely. So how then could such order come from chaos? Just, uh, no. Simply couldn't. So there no. must be what? There must be God. No. And that's his point. The sun rises in the east and sets in the west, and it's so methodical you could set your watch by it. How could that be? There has to be a designer, and that's his point. He says everybody knows that within them, mm-hmm. but they choose. They choose to hold that truth in unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. And he says because of that, the wrath of God will be revealed in them. Yeah. So it isn't just a matter of then saying, you know, this business of, of an agnostic doesn't know one way or the other. You're making a choice here, as it says in verse 25, who changed the truth of God. Once you begin to reject what is obvious, and God says you're without excuse, once you begin to change that, you've turned from truth to a lie. Right. And everything that develops out of that is going to lead to destruction. I think of in Proverbs, Proverbs fourteen twelve, and then I think it's repeated again in chapter 16. I'm not quite sure what verse, but here, here it is. There's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Couldn't be clearer. Could not have been clearer. And there's no such thing, can't be any such thing as an agnostic, because there's too much information. For people to look at. No one can say there's not enough knowledge for them to know whether there's a God of not, or not. It's just silly. We simply open up uh, our windows and look up at the stars at night, and that demonstrates that he's there. Greg, when you were growing up Roman Catholic, did you attend parochial schools? I did. Yeah. I was taught evolution. Sure. They, well, they, they still teach theistic evolution. Uh, there are 23 parochial high schools in the metro New Orleans area. They all teach theistic evolution. Unbelievable. Yeah. But they say, well, it's theistic. Okay, well, see, they still believe in God. Isn't that all right? Well, God's the origin, uh, the originator of the Big Bang, and then everybody evolves. So that makes Adam and Eve just a myth. But how do you harmonize that with anything? I mean, right. that's ridiculous. Plus, it, it does a big thing. <laughs> yeah. You think you're doing something for God by saying, oh, yeah, well, that was the process that he used. You begin to look at the process. First of all, a real evolutionist doesn't buy it one jot or tittle, okay? It, it can't, you can't have it both ways. And if you claim to believe in the Word of God and you try to mix in evolutionary ideas, it undermines the Word of God from the get-go. Amen. Please visit our website, thebereancall.org, to access our radio archives going back to 1999 and our newsletter going back to 1986. We offer daily updates by email or visit us on Facebook or Twitter. Are you looking for information about a specific topic? Go to thebereancall.org and click on Topics at the top of the page. Our online store is thebereancall.com. We offer a wide variety of books, tracks, CDs, and DVDs. Note that most of our ebooks are free. 
I'm Gary Carmichael. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you can join us again next week. Until then, we encourage you to search the scriptures 24-7. Though none go with me, I still will follow. No turning back, no turning back.